Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Latin American Directions. I'm Nicholas Sussman, and today we have our guest, Mateo Bermeo, to discuss cryptocurrencies in Latin America. Mateo is an innovative solution seeker with a background in law, passionate about defining and reshaping businesses to unlock the potential of emerging markets by using crypto, finance, and technology. Mateo now works as business operation manager for Reserve in Colombia and Mexico, a global project with the aims to scale prosperity through a digital currency and also leads global digital finance Latin American chapter, the leading global members association advocating and accelerating the adoption of best practices for digital assets. Mateo, it's a pleasure to have you here. And the first question I think for the audience is, what is crypto and why crypto? Why don't we stay with our regular currencies? Well, first off, thank you for having me here. And uh, a big hello to your audience uh, in Hawaii. It's a pleasure to be here. So basically, um, that's a hard question. But I'll say that my easy answer will be to um, cryptocurrencies were created to eliminate the middleman in transactions. That's what is stated in the, in the, in the Bitcoin um, white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto. And that's the reason why cryptocurrencies were created. They were created to simplify the fin uh, a financial system that was simply uh, difficult for the usual person to engage with, that was no clear in any way, and that it was especially um, difficult to manage because there was no overseer. This was uh, cryptocurrencies were born right after the 2008 crisis in which we were led by uh, financial greed in many ways. So I think that cryptocurrencies came in the picture to solve um, the issue of the middleman and only having to rely in with banks and in central banks. And that's why cryptocurrency was born. Right now, we see the applications of cryptocurrency in a much more broader way. Uh, we see applications in art, we see applications in real estate, we see applications in gaming, um, and we are not limited to cryptocurrencies. And that's why crypto is a whole new world um, that I think needs to be addressed in, in, in a lot of ways. Right. Uh, and we've seen crypto go from skepticism at the beginning and now gaining more support, even with platforms such as PayPal opening the option to trade cryptocurrencies uh, in the U.S. at least. Uh, how has been the situation in Latin America? Well, it's been hard. Um, I think that um, let's speak, start from Colombia, where we are based right now. Um, and afterwards, we can we can see a different panorama and, and the scenario in different countries of the of the of the region. Um, if we were to see how crypto adoption has been evolving, at first uh, it wasn't even a skepticism that was uh, in the, in in the in the in the region. It was an outright prohibition, and it was seen to be used by uh, bad actors in the ecosystem, simply uh, terrorists or, or, or something of the sort. You know, at first. Of course, once you understand that anybody can use any type of asset um, in any way whatsoever, we can use an eye um, to use in the kitchen or we can use an eye to commit a crime. Um, see, the, the knife has no uh, problem in that sense. It's simply how you use the technology. And that's why right now I think that with the recent executive order in the US, we are seeing a, a panorama and a, and a change in the landscape of what we are having uh, as regulations in every country in the region. Um, even today, we saw the, the, the Brazilian government and the Brazilian um, um, Senate uh, promoting a Bitcoin law in order to enforce cryptocurrencies, uh, cryptocurrency regulation in the country. The executive order by President Biden it, it created a system that was simply to um, set order in all of the agencies in the region in the US in order to to have cryptocurrencies um, to have a regulated the cryptocurrency space in the US. What we have in Colombia is a space that is now developing. I think that there is a lot of things going on uh, with our uh, financial entities and the financial agencies as well to promote the correct regulation of cryptocurrencies. And I think that this is what we're seeing in a lot of countries, Argentina, uh, Chile, Mexico, they are really open to uh, cryptocurrency regulation. Um, but what we seek right now is, I think, that a, an environment that promotes creativity and it does not truncate creativity. And I think that's, that, that is what we are needed. 
that for our our regulators and our our politicians to understand that this is a technology that needs intelligent regulation. And I think that that's the path that we're setting for. Okay, let's let's go a bit into that, right? Because at least from from my perspective and what I understand from you is that the key with crypto, at least at the beginning, was having no regulation, right? And now we're we're going back again into regulation. So let's speak about why regulating or not regulating crypto, and then how much regulating crypto. I think that um, at first, um, and, and you can see the anarchist in me in a way is that we want that this to be a space without any kind of regulation, simply like, like less fair and simply for the people, by the people, and with the people. Um, right now, as we see the space growing in value and we see the space growing in adoption, I think that it's pretty intelligent for us to promote intelligent regulation that promotes an, an, an ecosystem that allows for our organizations to thrive. However, uh, what I mean by intelligent regulation is not a burdensome um, executive orders or a burdensome agency that, should, that that oversees everything that we are doing and, and every step of the way. I think that there is a mixture in what we are in, we, we, we need and what is right now in the system. Because if you were to regulate us as the legacy financial systems, we are not going to be able to, to comply in many ways because technology, as you know, goes even faster than law, much more faster than law, much more. So that's why we need regulation that simply in, uh, oversees the technology, but does not limit it. So what we do as global digital finance uh, in Latin America is to promote over principles in order for them not to be obsolete once the technology changes. Because if you regulate technology, as soon as technology changes, the regulation will be obsolete. And as you know, technology goes really, really fast. And if you were to regulate cryptocurrencies in 2016, it will be a, a very different ecosystem than what we have right now with NFTs and with the metaverse and with everything that's going on. So that's why what we have right now and what we need right now are to create principles that are to be applied by all the players in the ecosystem and that we as, a, as, a, as an organization promote and that we think are the best thing to, to, to move forward. And I think that that will be the very best way to do it. Um, because as I'm telling you, I think that if you create an, a stale law, it will be easily, easily outdated because as you know, five years ago, crypto space was one thing and right now we're in another thing. And I think in 10 years, we're going to see a whole different universe or even a metaverse in 10 years. Right, right. You speak about uh, intelligent regulation, right? And about some principles. So please explain this a bit. Why? What are the governments trying to regulate, right? What are they trying to prevent? And uh, show us how those principles perhaps comply with that, with that, with that situ with that objectives. Sure. So basically, it's the the main uh, concern of governments when you start talking about cryptocurrency, it's uh, anti money laundering and terrorist finance. Like that, that's the number one issue that every government goes for. Um, and right now, what we promote is that. There are a lot of different uh, ways to go about AML and KYC and understanding your customer, understanding transactions, and overseeing the space. However, blockchain has the magnificent thing that is the, the only way that you can track every single transaction that occurs on the blockchain, you can, you can see it. And it's really, really, really easy to do it once you, you go uh, and have the right tools. There are several different ways to explore a blockchain network in order to see all the transactions that happen in this network. And that's why I think that the governments are understanding that they actually will be able to regulate this in a way that they can oversee transactions. And that's why we are seeing the promotion of central bank digital currencies. And I think that that's one way to do it. Um, however, I think that if you go back and if you try to understand why they're trying to regulate, because they're afraid. They're afraid that this may be used by bad actors. They're afraid that this may be used by, 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 by people that are, uh, of course, trying to perhaps launder money uh, as they use and they have been used in the banks for several years. And I think they're trying to promote the same type of regulation. However, I think that our principles, what we are trying to promote, is simply that you cannot apply the same ideas, of, let's say, the, 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 the tribal rule that you can 
uh, apply for a wire transfer um, to a cryptocurrency transaction. Why? Because there are many different components in, in a cryptocurrency transaction from one person to another. And if the, that person is an exchange, or if that person is a natural person, um, that I'm sending money, let's say, to you, the transaction is different, but it is overseeable. And I think that the governments will need to understand how they need to apply the principles of KYC, AML, uh, anti, anti, anti-terrorism financing to the new technologies. And I think that what we are seeing in several regulations, such as uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Malta, uh, even El Salvador, we are seeing an understanding of these new technologies and they trying to create over principles that do not become stale and that they put the burden on the company. And that's the good thing to do because I think that companies want to be self-regulated. Companies want to definitely uh, apply on all the, all, all the principles to comply with every single element uh, that the government requires. But I think that you can you need to understand that at the same time, this is a business that needs to work. And if you uh, burden the business with a lot of regulation, well, simply the bad actors are going to profit from this opportunity. Right, right. Uh, now let's speak about the advantages of crypto. I get the advantages for people, right? People who are investing or, or dealing with crypto have, have seen a significant increase in their, in their profits. That I get. Uh, but let's speak about advantages for the economy uh, and for the big picture of crypto. Um, I think that there are many advantages. Uh, if you were to ask me, one of the most important one is the opportunity to have the first sovereign capital um, or the first sovereign asset in the history of our world. Like right now, before the creation of Bitcoin, we were not able to have a cryptocurrency that was not um, let's say, overseed and controlled by the state. And I think that right now with Bitcoin and the several other cryptocurrencies that has, have followed, especially with Bitcoin, we have the opportunity to have sovereign assets that do not depend on the government's um, activities for good or for bad. Because if you see the good actors, let's say, um, this government, you see the Swiss franc as an stable currency that you can rely and, 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 and save value on that currency. However, the cases of Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Argentina show the other side of this coin, that if you depend uh, in your savings and your hard work in a government, and if this government doesn't have your best interest in mind, you are not able to defend the value of, what, of, of all the work that you have created and of all the work that you have done in your life. And this is what has happened to the people in Venezuela, Argentina, Zimbabwe, what is happening right now in the United States with, um, with, with record high inflation right now is that exact same thing, is that the government is not always having your best um, interest in mind. And that's why that cryptocurrencies allow the, the, the people to have a sovereign asset that does not rely and does not... Um, need the authorization of the government to exist. And I think that's a very important thing to understand. Um, that Bitcoin is inflationary or not, that we, we can discuss in an economic uh, point of view. However, what I think is that you allow for the people for the first time in the financial history of the world to have an asset that it's actually not even depending on a country. You, a Bitcoin is a Bitcoin and you can take it from Colombia to the US, from the US to Hong Kong, from Hong Kong to Australia, and from Australia to anywhere in the world. And all of this without the overseen entities that need to control or were controlling the money before. And I think that's that's really interesting to see because right now, yeah, we are seeing a change in, in, in the paradigms and, and in the re- everything that exists uh, right now as individuals. And I think that we're taking a little bit of power away from the government. And that's why they are scared. And that's why I think that's the most valuable thing about cryptocurrencies. Right. Uh... I, I get that, and and again, we're we're I see how this works in the benefit of the people, right? Uh, and I, I I I maybe I'm going to pick your brain a bit, uh, talking about perhaps redistribution, right? So there's a lot of people making good money with with crypto, which is perfectly fine. Uh, how 
do those benefits that these people are getting from their profits reflect in more development, better quality of life for other people, uh, and so on? How this economic activity coming from crypto has an impact on the rest of the society of people who are not doing crypto, for example? I think that one easy way to do it is, uh, let me talk about my job at Reserve. At Reserve, what we aim to do is to give the people of the world a currency that allows for safe storage of value. And I think that our main case right now, and we are the main cryptocurrency being used in Venezuela, is um, it, it's RSB being used in the country for uh, business transactions, for uh, supermarket transactions. Simply go into a store and buy whatever you want with the money that, uh, that, that you, 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 your son or your daughter has sent you uh, via uh, cryptocurrency and that you are allowed to use it, um, let's say in a way, circumventing the limits of the government that of that that a government has imposed on you i think that is that is something that before if we thought about this before this was magic and right now i think that's what we are seeing we're seeing the capabilities of cryptocurrency to allow for the change of life of people in a lot of countries um not only not only in in the transaction of daily daily you know, on, on a daily basis but people that were actually affected by hyperinflation in several countries were able to safeguard their assets by having them in cryptocurrency. The recent case of Ukraine and 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 the, the, the affected people of the country, they were able to save their, their money and travel safely abroad um, and seek refugee refuge in Poland or all the countries because they had cryptocurrency and they did not depend on the banks to be able to take their assets from one place to another. And I think that's how you see the, 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 the actual use of cryptocurrency in the world. Of course, uh, there are a lot of scam coins, there are a lot of uh, different projects that simply promote the, 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 their, their team to, to become rich. And I think that's something that happens in every single sector of the economy, that simply are people doing it for their own profit. But I do think that most of the projects in the cryptocurrency and in the crypto space, not only cryptocurrency, but in the crypto space, are trying to promote a more egalitarian way to access financial services. Um, let's speak about the other way around. Let's speak about the, 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 the Colombian side of the business world. Simply, if you were Colombian, you were unable to access um, the financial markets besides Colombia. Right now, you can actually um, become a, a, a member of different real estate ventures. You can invest in companies. You can own a part of a company or simply stake a token and get rewards in a different con country, in a different state, and right now, you, without any need of traveling, without any need to go ahead and, and open an account in a foreign country. And I think that's, that's the real change that we're seeing. We're seeing a real distribution and an openness of what we are having in the, in, in the world. Right now, the, the fine, beforehand, the financial industry was limited to individuals with a certain net worth from certain countries. And right now, we are seeing that change radically. And I think that's key. That's very interesting, Mateo. Uh, and we already discussed like the differences in regulation, right, at the governmental level. Let's speak about the use of people of cryptocurrency. Is it similar in Latin America as people use it in the US? Is there more people? Is there less people? Why are there less people if there are less and, and so on? Yes, of course. Um, well, Venezuela is the first country in Latin America um, per capita, if you were to, to see it, that uses cryptocurrency. And I think that's simply understood if you see the government position and the closeness of, closeness of the economy. And that's why once you understand the power of cryptocurrency, the next governments that uh, the next best cases, um, you understand simply like Argentina, hyperinflation country for the last 20 years, people are using it massively. Brazil, there is uh, an overcharge if you were to spend your money um, from in Brazil in other countries. And that's why people send money abroad by using cryptocurrencies. The same thing with Peru, Ecuador, um, and even the case of El Salvador. When people send a, a five billion a year remittance um, country, and people are sending cryptocurrencies to circumvent the the usual financial actors that take five even ten percent of this five billion dollar industry in El Salvador and distribute it to the people, and I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a frictionless environment in which people can send money one to another without an intermediary in the middle, and that allows 
for a better ecosystem with a lot less friction and a lot less speed. And once you see this in an, in, 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 in a way, this, is, this promotes a huge growth in the economy. We see it in El Salvador. We are seeing it right now in Honduras. We see it in Colombia. We see it in Venezuela. And I think that as a whole world, once you understand the power of cryptocurrencies to eliminate the, the, the borders and the, and the limits that, that were before established by money and by currencies, I think that you understand the real power of what we're building in the crypto space. Right. Uh, so you said this enables access to the financial uh, services for, for regular people. Does it also help to close the gap between the global north and the global south? Definitely, definitely. Um, so once again, let me get to the case of Colombia. Uh, if we, we have a huge amount of refugees right now in Colombia from Venezuela. They arrived to Colombia, almost 2 million people, and to open a bank account for them was really, really hard because there are a lot of difficulties. Uh, banks don't want to uh, open up bank accounts for Venezuelan people. They had to rely on cryptocurrencies because there was no limit to what they could do. And they were able to open an account, which is a virtual uh, a, a wallet, uh, in which they have their assets, and they were able to freely transfer them to the family in Venezuela or receive money from their folks all the world. And that's really, really key. And I think that's how you are actually being able to uh, eliminate the, 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 let's say, the easiness that people in the, in the global north have. And right now, uh, we are allowing anyone in the world to access all the financial services that were before prohibited to them. Right. But then one final remark from you, you said you're passionate about innovation, right? Uh, let's speak about, uh, as a final statement, about the relationship between crypto and innovation, how crypto supports innovation as a final message. I think that there has never been a better space that promotes um, creativity and innovation than crypto. Why? Because I think that the rules are not set. And I think that all industries are now taking cues from the crypto space in which we are uh, thinkers and people with open minds in order to contribute different and really game-changing solutions to actual problems in the world. We are not seeking um, million high dollar valuations because that's not the objective of crypto. Crypto is actually creating a different economy for different people. And I think that is what promotes a radical different approach in creativity and innovation. And I think that uh, before Mr. Satoshi Nakamoto, whatever he was, um, and where he, he may be, I think that he opened the floodgates for this to become a real a game changer. And I think that we haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg right now in what we are gonna see for the next years to come. Thank you very much, Mateo. Everyone, this was Latin American Directions, Mateo Bermeo and see each other in two weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.